Welcome to Fiction Narratives. Chapter 31 Towson's subordinate's report is accurate. Thor quietly approached the meteorite crater on a nearby hillside. Despite Jane Foster and Dr. Selvig offering their assistance, Thor politely declined. He believed the government had sealed off the heavily guarded area around the crater, and he didn't want these kind-hearted Midgardians to risk themselves. However, Thor had overestimated his abilities. As the god of thunder, he relished direct confrontations and relied on his physical strength. Infiltration was unfamiliar to him, especially since he had lost his divine powers. Though he believed his infiltration skills to be exceptional, he couldn't have anticipated what awaited him. Unbeknownst to Thor, every move he made was captured by the surveillance cameras. Meanwhile, inside the base, Hawkeye had already detected Thor's presence. Prepared for combat, he set aside his compound bow and contemplated their next move. Should we apprehend him and interrogate him he suggested. Carlson, however, had his own plans, likely instructed by Nick Fury before his departure. After a brief contemplation, Carlson replied, let him proceed. I want to see if he can actually lift that hammer. Understood, Hawkeye acknowledged, comprehending Carlson's underlying message. While Fang Mo had claimed that no one else could wield the hammer, Nick Fury, naturally suspicious, couldn't fully trust anyone. Thus, he likely instructed Carlson to think independently and not blindly follow Fang Mo's words. Fang Mo, on the other hand, paid no heed to these dynamics. His sole objective was to exploit S.H.I.E.L.D.S. authority to unlock the module without concerning himself with gaining favor or trust from others. Fang Mo dismissed such matters as trivial. With Carlson's approval, the agents in the vicinity deliberately eased their surveillance. Soon, Thor successfully infiltrated the base, his gaze fixed on the meteorite crater ahead. Excitement surged within him as he anticipated the imminent restoration of his divine powers. Mjolnir, Thor's mighty hammer, seemed to beckon him, emitting a potent electromagnetic field. Dark clouds rapidly gathered in the night sky, accompanied by thunderous roars and torrential rainfall. The powerful electromagnetic field disrupted all electronic devices within the base, sowing chaos. Seizing the moment, Thor tore a piece of curtain and entered the meteorite crater. As his eyes fell upon the hammer lying on the ground, a relieved smile played on Thor's lips. Acting instinctively, he strode toward his weapon, intending to reclaim it. However, his smile vanished as he gripped the hammer's handle. Once an instrument of immense might, the hammer now felt as heavy as a thousand pounds. Try as he might, even with bulging veins and utmost effort, Thor failed to lift it from the ground it remained immovable, rejecting its master. In an instant, Thor plummeted from heavenly elation to abysmal despair, anger, frustration, disappointment, and pain flooded his heart, culminating in a despairing roar that echoed like the lament of a deranged soul. No. Ironically, the thunderstorm in the sky underscored his anguish. Raindrops pelted the ground, creating a splattering of mud in a cruel twist of fate. Thor, realizing he couldn't reclaim his divine power, crumbled to his knees on the muddy ground, drained of strength. His mind went blank, allowing the approaching SHIELD agents to seize him and lead him to the interrogation room. Shortly after, Carlson entered the room to question Thor, but the outcome fell far short of his expectations. Unable to wield the hammer, Thor retreated into himself, offering no response to Carlson's inquiries. He appeared shattered, devastated by the significant blow. Carlson contemplated for a while and decided it would be best to let Thor calm down before proceeding further. If Thor continued to resist, Carlson didn't hesitate to consider doing any means necessary, as SHIELD excelled in the art of interrogation. Thor's previous performance had deeply disappointed Carlson. Despite Fang Mo proclaiming him as the god of thunder, Thor couldn't fly, summon lightning, or even lift the hammer. His combat skills were in disarray, relying solely on his physical strength to recklessly pummel opponents. Even without his divine power, shouldn't a god radiate some divine aura where was his godly self-assurance where were his wisdom and glory as a deity reflecting on Thor's past actions, it seemed more fitting to label him a delusional lunatic than a god, simply dependent on his physical prowess. To be honest, apart from Fang Mo's words, there was no evidence to substantiate Thor's claim as the Norse god of thunder. Even Carlson began to question Fang Mo's reliability, 
wondering if his prophetic abilities were accurate. Unlike Nick Fury, Coulson had limited interaction with Fang Mo and remained uncertain of his knowledge of Shield and the secrets of their world. Lost in thought, Coulson was suddenly interrupted. Sir one of Coulson's subordinates spoke up. This individual seems to be struggling with mental issues. Look, he appears to be engaged in a conversation with himself in front of the mirror. Should we bring in a psychologist? Hm Coulson raised an eyebrow, perplexed by the revelation. Gazing through the one-way glass, he indeed observed Thor seemingly engrossed in dialogue with an unseen presence. It was more than mere muttering, Thor's focused eyes fixated on the mirror on the wall, conveying a genuine connection with someone or something. Yet, S.H.I.E.L.D.S. advanced surveillance equipment, including cameras and thermal imaging, detected nothing within the room. Thor's behavior grew increasingly concerning. Perhaps he suffered from a severe condition such as delusions. Activate audio surveillance and monitor his conversations, Carlson decided after a brief pause. His agent nodded and pressed a button, allowing Thor's voice to resonate through the speakers, I should be the one apologizing. Thank you for coming to see me for the last time. Wait, Loki, what's happening to you? As Thor spoke, his bewildered expression intensified, accompanied by a sudden heavy thud. In the blink of an eye, a burst of green light enveloped the room, and a slender man materialized within the confines of the interrogation room. Chapter 32 Coulson was stunned as a person materialized out of thin air in the interrogation room. Who is that he exclaimed. The person, of course, was none other than Loki, Thor's brother. In Thor 1, Loki had deliberately deceived Thor by falsely accusing him of killing Odin, shifting the blame onto Thor. His plan was to strip Thor of his eligibility to wield Mjolnir and make him live as a mortal on Earth, all while securing the throne of Asgard for himself. However, something unexpected happened. Just as Loki was about to employ his deceitful words, he noticed a blocky and tall creature lurking in the corner. This creature stood silently, emanating an eerie presence. Surprisingly, Loki, who was accustomed to instilling fear in others, felt genuine fright. He instinctively entered combat mode and threw a knife at the creature. Thor was intrigued by this sudden turn of events and questioned Loki about it. It became evident that Loki's combat abilities were lacking when the creature remained unharmed by his small throwing knife. In fact, the creature took a step forward, compelling Loki to retreat. As a result, Loki's illusion was dispelled, revealing his true presence to Kalsen and the other agents. While they were still stunned, Fang Ammo had already reached the door of the interrogation room. Without waiting for a response, he entered. Kalsen was momentarily stunned but quickly composed himself and followed Fang Ammo inside. What day is it today are we celebrating something in the Nine Realms Fang Ammo immediately began speaking. Why are Odin's two sons here on Earth, or Midgard, I presume? As Fang Ammo spoke, Steve Stand reappeared behind him. Loki cautiously observed Fang Ammo and asked, who are you no, wait what exactly are you? I am Fang Ammo, he responded directly, also known as a stand user. Loki remained silent but instinctively narrowed his eyes. He had no knowledge of Fang Ammo, and if it weren't for the formidable creature accompanying him, Loki would have dismissed Fang Ammo as an ordinary mortal. However, it was clear that Fang Ammo possessed extraordinary abilities, but Loki couldn't sense any aura from him. The mystery surrounding Fang Ammo unsettled Loki as he couldn't discern his true nature. Direct confrontation was not Loki's style, especially with a group of troublesome mortals standing behind Fang Ammo. After considering for a moment, Loki cast a spell, leaving an illusion in his place before circling behind. It's worth noting that Fang Ammo and his stand shared a vision, allowing him to see Loki from Steve's point of view. In response, Fang Ammo directly stated, Enough with the pretense. Come out now. HHMM, who Kalsen was thoroughly perplexed. With Loki standing right in front of him, he couldn't comprehend whom Fang Ammo was addressing. Loki momentarily paused upon hearing Fang Mo's words. You can see him. Even Thor, sitting on the side, was momentarily stunned. My stand has seen through your tricks, so don't even think about sneaking up on me, Fang Ammo declared, crossing his arms and staring at the hidden Loki. After hearing this, Loki chose to dispel the illusion. What? 
Kalsen widened his eyes as he saw Loki vanish and suddenly reappear from behind. It was the first time he had witnessed such a bizarre thing. An odd intuition arose in Kalsen's heart for some reason. Unlike the delusional patient claiming to be the god of thunder, he felt that this person in front of him was the real deal. Um, who is he Kalsen couldn't help but ask Fang Mo after a moment of contemplation. Loki, the god of mischief, Fang Mo explained. Don't Westerners believe in gods haven't you heard of the famous Loki? Well. Kalsen hesitated for a moment. We mostly believe in Jesus over here. Oh, I see, Fang Mo nodded, then suddenly asked, So, let me ask you, who do you think is stronger, Odin or Jesus? Huh. Not only Kalsen, but even Thor and Loki on the other side were taken aback. After all, Odin was their father. Discussing their father's power in front of his sons, what was the intention behind it? Uh, of course, Kalsen was also baffled. They were currently in a standoff with two gods, and he suddenly brought up this topic. Was it really appropriate? But before Kalsen could respond, Fang Mo continued, saying, Actually, I think Odin is stronger. Of course, all father is stronger, he's the king of gods. Thor instinctively replied. However, he immediately remembered the news of his father's death, caused by his own incompetence as a son. He fell into sorrow, saying, The glory of our father, Odin, will forever last in the history of the Nine Realms. Bleep for patron only experience. Can't he cancel me today fam censoring just to be safe? As he spoke, Fang Mo intentionally smiled at Loki. Don't you agree? Upon hearing the term Frost Giants, both Thor and Loki fell into silence. Thor was silent because he thought of his own secret attack on the Frost Giants, which led to the impending war between Jotunheim and Asgard. His recklessness and disobedience indirectly killed his father Odin, and now he was filled with remorse and guilt, reflecting on his past choices. It seemed that his father was not wrong. His past self was truly a madman, obsessed only with the glory of war, without understanding the true meaning of love and peace. But Loki was different. He felt that Fang Mo was deliberately targeting him. Chapter 33 Loki was convinced that Fang Mo had deliberately targeted him, but he couldn't understand how Fang Mo had discovered his true identity. Recently, during Thor's ill-fated invasion of Jotunheim, Loki had learned that he was actually a frost giant. The magic of the frost giants had revealed his lineage, showing that he was not Odin's son but rather a despised enemy of Asgard a frost giant. Instead of sharing this revelation with Thor and their comrades, Loki had chosen to confront Odin directly. To his surprise, the elderly Odin had succumbed to Loki's scolding and entered a deep slumber known as Odin's sleep. Witnessing Odin's collapse, Loki realized the depth of his affection for the old king. Despite his resentment towards Odin's favoritism towards Thor, Loki had never harbored thoughts of harming him. However, a kingdom required a ruler, and with Odin incapacitated, Asgard urgently needed a temporary replacement. Since Thor was in exile, all eyes naturally turned to Loki. Being Odin's son and with no one else aware of his frost giant heritage, they believed him to be a suitable candidate. Consequently, Loki seamlessly and logically assumed the role of the acting king of Asgard. Nevertheless, just because others were not oblivious to his true identity, that didn't mean Loki wasn't anxious. He dreaded the exposure of his secret. While Odin had accepted his frost giant lineage, Asgard was not defined solely by Odin's acceptance. If his true nature were to be unveiled, Loki risked becoming a pariah, despised by all. As the god of mischief, Loki swiftly devised a cunning plan. Thor's reckless incursion into Jotunheim had shattered the peace treaty, pushing Asgard to the brink of war with the frost giants. Seizing this critical moment, Loki resolved to annihilate Jotunheim and exterminate every frost giant, sparing only himself. By eliminating all other frost giants, his heritage would lose significance even if exposed. After all, wouldn't his actions demonstrate unwavering loyalty to Asgard the king, Loki, sacrificing his own kin to protect the realm wasn't that the epitome of righteousness by doing so, he would ascend as the greatest hero in Asgard, beyond reproach. Of course, in the event of failure, Loki could conveniently shift the blame onto his brother, Thor, who was responsible for his impulsive actions. And he, Loki, would merely be covering for him. Lost in his thoughts, 
Loki couldn't help but revel in his own cleverness. However, he hadn't anticipated that his plan had only just begun when he encountered Fang Emo. Loki struggled to comprehend why someone as peculiar as Fang Emo would appear in Midgard, a realm intended for mortals. From every angle, Fang Emo appeared far from ordinary. Who are you? Loki fixed Fang Emo with a stern gaze and inquired, I am the king of Asgard, entrusted with protecting the nine realms. Clearly, you do not belong to Midgard. Pray, tell me what are you? To boost his confidence, Loki brandished Odin's weapon, Gunnir. Isn't Odin the king of Asgard's weapon? Fang Emo asked cheerfully. When did it become yours? Our father is already dead, Thor replied, bowing his head in deep remorse. He explained on Loki's behalf, it's all because of my foolish recklessness that led to these consequences. According to our mother's wishes and everyone else's, I will forever be banished here as a sinner, and Loki should rightfully become the new king of Asgard. Thor's straightforward and simple nature made him particularly susceptible to deception. His brother, however, was the god of mischief, and Thor had yet to realize he had been tricked. He still believed Odin to be truly dead and, despite his own anguish, he spoke up for Loki. Odin is truly dead Fang Emo rubbed his chin and deliberately inquired, he is the great king of the gods. Can't he be killed just because of a little disagreement with his son could there be some hidden information behind this? Thor was suddenly stunned by Fang Mo's words. For example, a malicious plot devised by the frost giants, Fang Emo smiled and continued, because they feared the power of the Alphather Odin, they resorted to these underhanded methods. And Odin, perhaps due to excessive concern for you, the absence of his first warrior by his side, fell for it out of carelessness. Nonsense. Loki couldn't hold back and yelled, interrupting Thor. Loki. Thor looked at his brother with confusion, wondering why he had suddenly become so agitated. Loki was genuinely frightened now. He had a strong intuition that Fang Emma was specifically targeting him, especially with his continuous mention of plots devised by the Frost Giants. Wasn't that an indirect accusation against himself is the greatness of our father so easily trampled upon by the Frost Giants Loki exclaimed. He only thought Thor was too impulsive, which led to turmoil in the Nine Realms. He was already old and frail, yet anxious, and that's why he collapsed. With his words, Loki forcefully struck the ground with Gungnir. The powerful divine energy created a shockwave, pushing the mortals present several steps backward. Fang Emo, however, remained unaffected. After devouring a whole group of essence berries, a punch from Loki wouldn't even make him flinch. He wasn't intimidated by Loki. Brother, I'm sorry, but I'm powerless in this matter as well, Loki said, dismissing the crowd. He turned to Thor and added, one of the conditions for the ceasefire with Jotunheim is your permanent exile. I Thor's face displayed sorrow and remorse. I'm sorry. Loki. Loki couldn't bear to stay another minute. He had to quickly return and devise a plan to counter Fang Emo, otherwise, his own scheme would undoubtedly fail. With that in mind, Loki bid farewell to Thor. Brother, I have to go. After his words, Loki struck the floor with Gungnir, and the energy of the Bifrost Bridge pierced through the ceiling. In an instant, he disappeared from sight. Chapter 34 Where did he go? Kalsen asked Fang Emo, confused by Loki's sudden disappearance. Did he turn invisible again? No, Fang Emo shook his head. This time he actually left. Where to Asgard Kalsen was surprised. Before he could get clarification, several technicians rushed over, holding a stack of data, eager to report the situation to him. After listening for a while, Fang Emo understood that their instruments had detected an extraordinary energy fluctuation. The analysis indicated the creation of a temporary channel through pure energy, similar to Einstein's proposed Rosen Bridge theory. It seemed to connect two distinct spaces using powerful energy. In simpler terms, the technicians suspected the presence of a nearby temporal spatial tunnel. Hearing the report and considering Loki's previous behavior, Kalsen began to believe in the existence of Asgard. However, this belief also raised concerns within him. He had just encountered extraterrestrials, and mishandling the situation could pose a crisis to Earth. He realized the need to report this matter immediately to the director. Now that Loki has left, I guess there's nothing for me to do here, right Fang Emo said, preparing to leave the interrogation room. 
You guys can handle this mess on your own. I'll take my leave. Wait. Thor, sitting in the interrogation chair, suddenly interjected. Fang Ammo stopped and turned back, curious. What's up? Thor hesitated for a moment before speaking earnestly, Who are you exactly? I apologize if I offended you earlier, but I'm incredibly curious about your identity because... In Midgard, ordinary humans can't possibly possess such extensive knowledge about Asgard. Mr. Fang Ammo is a technical advisor for our SHIELD agency, Carlson explained. He is a powerful sorcerer from an ancient eastern country, and together, we are dedicated to protecting this world from harm. Fang Ammo silently glanced at Carlson, surprised by his explanation. Carlson met his gaze, silently pleading for understanding. Very well, Fang Ammo shrugged. Titles didn't matter much to him, and Carlson was an amiable person. Whether in the original work or in this situation, it wouldn't hurt to show some respect. So, you're a sorcerer Thor recalled something upon hearing this. My father once told me that while the mortals of Midgard are weak, a few have mastered mysterious magic. They have safeguarded Earth from threats of other dimensions for generations, and the most powerful among them is known as the Sorcerer Supreme, possessing the power to foresee the future. So, are you the Sorcerer Supreme? Thor's curiosity prompted him to ask. Kalsen and Fang Ammo exchanged glances at Thor's question. Kalsen hadn't expected Fang Ammo to be so formidable that even the gods of Norse mythology held him in high regard. But before Kalsen could fully comprehend the situation, Fang Mo's next words left him perplexed once again. Sorcerer Supreme Fang Ammo shrugged and calmly responded, Isn't the Sorcerer Supreme the Ancient One it's not me, and it has nothing to do with me. Both Kalsen and Thor were surprised by this revelation. Thor was surprised because he had assumed Fang Emma was the Sorcerer Supreme due to his extensive knowledge of Asgard. Even without his godly powers, Thor sensed a hint of fear from Loki towards Fang Emma, indicating the mage's formidable strength. He might even surpass the Sorcerer Supreme, the mightiest protector among mortals. Kalsen, on the other hand, was genuinely perplexed. Kalsen hadn't anticipated the existence of such a powerful magician hiding on Earth. According to Thor, the Sorcerer Supreme was not only powerful but also benevolent, safeguarding the world. However, this raised concerns. If the Sorcerer Supreme could remain concealed, what would prevent malevolent entities from doing the same shield had no knowledge of the extra-dimensional creatures the Sorcerer Supreme fought against? What if the Sorcerer Supreme made an inadvertent mistake these thoughts cast doubt on the safety of Earth, defying their previously held assumptions? In contrast to Kalsen's profound reflections, Thor focused on the immediate matter. He addressed Fang Emo directly, acknowledging his extraordinary abilities. Even if you're not the Sorcerer Supreme, you must be a powerful mage. Fang Emo couldn't help but chuckle at Thor's observation. It seems your temperament has greatly improved, he remarked. Becoming mortal seems to have its benefits. At least you have learned the value of courtesy. Regret filled Thor's voice as he replied, Unfortunately, I realized it too late. I have failed to live up to my father's expectations. Perhaps I am unworthy of being the rightful ruler of Asgard after all. Fang Emo pondered for a moment, then offered his perspective. Well, in reality, there are various types of kings, he mused. Some are valiant warriors who conquer lands and wealth for their people, while others pursue peace, fostering harmony and joy in their kingdoms. The role of a king is not confined to a single mold. Each person possesses their unique character and ideals. In my view, as long as you are loved and respected by your subjects, deserving of their admiration, you can already be deemed a righteous ruler. Thor nodded, contemplating Fang Mo's words. I have pondered this matter. When war erupts, Asgard's warriors will inevitably suffer heavy losses. They have loved ones and friends, just as I do. But Asgard's warriors are willing to die defending their homeland, unafraid of sacrifice because they deem it honorable. However, as the one instigating a war, I'm ashamed. My people would perish needlessly due to my personal desires. Their loved ones would be devastated because I have acted selfishly. Fang Mo's surprise was evident as he responded to Thor's newfound self. Later, he even doubted whether Thor could still wield Mjolnir, given Loki's influence. Loki's deceit had only aimed to rub salt in Thor's wounds, yet unexpectedly, 
Thor began introspecting his own mistakes. It wouldn't be long before he reclaimed his divine power. But it is too late for me, Thor sighed, his head hung low in dejection. My father is already dead, and I have no opportunity to demonstrate my new self. Fang Mo offered a glimmer of hope with a smile. At the very least, you can uncover the truth. The truth Thor raised his head in astonishment. What do you mean? Fang Mo posed a thought-provoking question. Do you truly believe that Odin, the king of the gods, could perish so easily or, to put it differently, don't you find Odin's death suspicious? Thor's response would reveal his comprehension. Well. If he failed to grasp the implication of Fang Mo's words at this point, he would appear foolish. Are you suggesting that father's death was not as it seemed but I have already been exiled? What should I do? Fang Mo's smile persisted as he advised Thor, that question should be answered by you. And also imagine if your friend had committed the same mistake and was exiled here, what would you do? Thor blurted out almost instinctively, revealing his true character. Having erred, one should make amends. And I would visit my friend in secret. Realization struck him suddenly, his eyes widening incredulously as he gazed at Fang Mo. However, Fang Mo had already turned and departed, leaving Thor behind. Chapter 35 As Carlson left the interrogation room, he caught up with Fang Mo and asked, So, you're saying someone from Asgard will come looking for him later? Curiosity peaked, Carlson pressed further, Do you know what kind of people they are will there be conflicts or clashes of divine power? Fang Mo replied directly, if you're worried about conflicts, then just let him go. Kalsen hesitated, contemplating the situation. But will there really be a conflict the guy seems to have a decent character? Old Kalsen, Nick Fury assigned this matter to you, not me, Fang Ammo said, rubbing his forehead. He's s.h.i.e.l.ds benefactor, not someone specifically here to help them brainstorm ideas. Besides, Nick Fury doesn't fully trust me either. Why should I bother with these thankless tasks am I doing it out of boredom? Kalsen was left speechless, unsure how to respond. In any case, I'm going to study magic. Call me when we have some ancient warrior types of people showing up in town, Fang Ammo declared before retreating into his room. Ancient warriors Kalsen stood there, momentarily puzzled. Before he could decipher the situation, the door swung open once again, and Fang Ammo stuck his head out. By the way, instruct your subordinates to bring me an ostrich capable of hatching eggs. Hakalsen was genuinely confused. Before he could inquire about the strange request, the door abruptly closed. Kalsen sighed and massaged his temples, feeling a headache. It appeared that despite the benefactor's generosity, his demands were indeed bizarre. Taking a deep breath, Kalsen reached for the intercom. Calling headquarters, please respond. This is Kalsen. I know it sounds outrageous, but it's an order. Please arrange and transport an ostrich capable of hatching eggs to town, New Mexico, within half an hour. SHIELD demonstrated impressive efficiency in their operations. Despite Fang Mo's outlandish request, when Kalsen reported the matter to Nick Fury, SHIELD swiftly sprang into action. Multiple departments immediately engaged and soon the team of agents located a private zoo in San Francisco. They negotiated with a bewildered zookeeper and expedited the transportation of an ostrich, currently incubating eggs, to the town using a quinjet. Meanwhile, on Fang Mo's side, having an ostrich could prove to be useful. Hadn't Fang Mo mentioned his previous real-world experiments with Minecraft items he had already tested the Ender's Hand and the Essence Berry, both of which had greatly benefited him when materialized in the real world. However, Steve's backpack still contained several other items awaiting examination. One of these items was a dragon egg. In fact, during Thor's attempt to steal Mjolnir at the base, Fang Ammo had already materialized the dragon egg while eavesdropping on the conversation between Thor and Loki through Steve. Otherwise, considering his character, he would have gone there himself. In any case, it unfolded exactly as Fang Ammo had envisioned. After materializing the dragon egg, it transformed into a genuine egg. Slightly larger than a soccer ball, the egg had a deep, dark shell adorned with scattered purple spots. The dragon egg pulsed with a rhythmic frequency, emitting faint purple energy dots a phenomenon that intrigued Fang Mo. 
but what truly astonished him was its resonance with the Ender Hand Force field. In this realm of reality, Fang Mo struggled to comprehend the impossible. The collision of the Minecraft world with reality seemed to be the cause. The Ender Hand Force, derived from the mutant Enderman, and the Dragon Egg, hailing from the mighty Ender Dragon, shared Ender tributes, potentially explaining their harmonious connection. The more Fang Mo pondered, the deeper his curiosity grew regarding the Dragon Egg. In the original Minecraft version, the egg was a mere prop, incapable of hatching into an Ender Dragon. Yet, in the real world, guided by the end energy, Fang Mo sensed the nurturing of life within the egg. Despite his desire to hatch the dragon egg, Fang Mo found the idea of a grown man dedicating his days to egg sitting utterly preposterous. Imagining Nick Fury's reaction, laughter would surely consume him. Considering this, Fang Mo resolved to entrust the matter to the professionals, thus requesting an egg hatching proficient ostrich from Carlson. Thanks to his previous gesture of offering a gold ingot to Nick Fury, Fang Mo now enjoyed the unwavering support of SHIELD their efficiency unparalleled. Within a mere half hour, an ostrich arrived at Fang Mo's room. His gaze fixated upon the nervous creature, unsettled by the sudden environment change and jarring transportation. The ostrich, with large eyes locked onto Fang Mo, intermittently spread its wings, displaying a hint of dominance. Meanwhile, Fang Mo grappled with the conundrum of holding the precious Ender Dragon Egg. Considering the ostrich's current state, he dared not entrust the hatching process to the creature. What if the egg accidentally met its demise the resurrection of the Ender Dragon would necessitate a perilous journey to the end? Damn, I should have asked Carlson to bring an animal expert, Fang Mo lamented, helplessly massaging his forehead. For now, he decided to await the ostrich's calm demeanor. On the other hand, he could experiment with other Minecraft items. Thus, he instructed his stand, Steve, to retrieve a colossal purple blade resembling a door panel from the alchemy bag. This massive blade, known as the Hellish Cleaver, stood as the most formidable weapon in the Tinker's Construct mod. Prior to embarking on his Marvel World expedition, Fang Mo had Steve forge two Hellish Cleavers one for himself and one for reality testing. With a gentle stroke along the blade's back, Fang Mo initiated the reality testing. In an instant, a flash of white light confirmed the successful transition. With a resounding thud, the gargantuan deep purple hellish cleaver struck the ground, startling the nearby ostrich, which squawked in alarm. It actually works, Fang Mo exclaimed, his eyes gleaming with excitement as he retrieved the colossal blade. The reality testing had intensified the hellish cleaver's potency. The blade spanned nearly two meters in length, several tens of centimeters in width, and possessed the thickness of a door panel. Its cutting edge, however, remained razor sharp. Notably, the weapon consisted entirely of pure hellish cleaver alloy, rendering its weight unimaginable. Even with his consumption of numerous essence berries, Fang Mo would still rely on the power of the Ender Hand Force field to wield this weapon effectively. With his newfound weapon in hand, Fang Mo indulged in playful testing and exploration. As the night waned, sleep beckoned Fang Mo, and he succumbed to its call. The following morning, as he caught up on rest, Carlson knocked on his door. Mr. Fang Mo, it appears that the warriors you mentioned have arrived. Chapter 36, Fang Mo vs the Destroyer 1. In fact, this occurred over an hour ago, Carlson said, his head throbbing as he looked at the slightly drowsy Fang Mo. The researchers detected a powerful energy fluctuation, similar to Loki's previous departure. Subsequently, my subordinates discovered four individuals in medieval attire carrying weapons in town. I understand, Fang Ammo replied with a yawn, preparing to freshen up at his own leisure. So, you brought Thor back? Yes, Carlson nodded. Last night, Dr. Selvig forged documents. Technically, he should have been arrested for such an offense. However, after careful consideration, I chose to release Thor. What is our plan now? Fang Mo turned on the faucet, beginning to wash his face and brush his teeth. We will wait and observe, Carlson replied after pondering for a moment. I don't believe the Asgardians, Thor at the very least, pose a threat to Earth. Instead of remaining oblivious, Shield would prefer to establish a friendly diplomatic relationship with Asgard. That's a sensible idea. Having freshened up, Fang Mo's drowsiness had significantly subsided. 
but before we can engage in peaceful discussions, we must finish the battle. Battle Carlson asked, bewildered. Aren't those four individuals Thor's allies why would they fight? You could inquire with your subordinates if they witnessed anything beyond those four ancient warriors, Fang Emo suggested. For instance, a towering walking armor. A walking armor of towering size Carlson was taken aback. What exactly is that? Look, Fang Emo pointed out the window. You should be able to see it soon. Carlson followed Fang Mo's indication and observed the sky nearby suddenly darkening. Swirling dark clouds swiftly amassed, signaling a troublesome development. In the next instant, these clouds converged into a tornado and crashed into the ground with a deafening boom. What on earth is that Carlson stared at the bewildering scene, but his phone rang. Answering it, he heard the panicked voice of his subordinate. All right, they have sighted the walking armor. Carlson ended the call and said to Fang Ammo, very well. Fang Ammo grinned, beckoning as the massive cleaving blade embedded in the ground soared into his hand. I've long awaited a worthy opponent. Finally, I found one. Carlson wanted to speak, but in the next second, Fang Mo's figure instantaneously dissolved into purple particles. After a brief silence, Carlson picked up his phone again. Notify the personnel in the town to immediately coordinate an evacuation of local residents. There is a likelihood of significant events occurring later. At this very moment, the battle had already commenced in the town. However, based on the current situation, the destroyer armor held an indisputable advantage. Yet, it was to be expected. After all, the destroyer armor was Odin's battle attire during his youth, forged from URU metal and infused with various divine realm enchantments, it was even employed by Odin to safeguard the treasures within Asgard. Undoubtedly, its combat prowess was unparalleled. The combat power of Thor's closest allies, the renowned warriors of Asgard Vals Tag, Hagan, Fondral, and Sif proved woefully inadequate against the destroyer armor. Despite their bravery and combat prowess, they were clearly outmatched by the destroyer armor, lacking knowledge, and relying solely on their Asgardian strength and cold weapons. Could they truly withstand the might of URU metal with their regular attacks for the glory of Asgard? Val's tag bellowed as he charged forward, raising his battle axe high to strike the head of the destroyer armor. However, the destroyer armor swatted him away like a mere nuisance, sending him crashing into a nearby car and experiencing excruciating pain that rendered him unable to rise. As the faceplate of the destroyer armor opened, preparing to unleash a devastating laser, Sif launched a surprise attack from behind, pinning it to the ground with her blade. Relieved, Val's tag observed the scene as Sif confidently stood on the immobilized armor, embodying the title of the bravest warrior of Asgard. Their joy was short-lived as the destroyer armor abruptly reactivated. Its metallic plates rotated, causing Sif to move from its back to its chest, aligning perfectly with the faceplate that emitted a surge of flames. Reacting swiftly, Sif leaped to the side, narrowly avoiding the laser that grazed her arm and shot skyward. Recognizing their inability to defeat the destroyer armor, the group hastily retreated, seeking distance and strategizing. However, the relentless destroyer armor provided no respite, sweeping its laser across the ground, propelling Sif into the air and striking the others as they attempted a rescue, sending all four hurtling through the air. Val's tag crashed into a shop at the street corner, struggling to regain his bearings as he witnessed the destroyer armor aiming at him. Without mercy, the armor unleashed its laser, obliterating the storefront in an instant, its intense heat felt even from a hundred meters away. Unable to stand idly by, Thor spotted Sif hiding in a corner, still determined to ambush the destroyer, and rushed over, gripping her trembling shoulder. Sif, don't take unnecessary risks, Thor urged, acknowledging the formidable opponent and the slim chances of success in their battle. No, Sif gritted her teeth resolutely, even if it costs me my life, I choose to die as a warrior. This moment. It will be etched in history. Thor, changed by his experiences, offered an encouraging smile. Sif, live on. And tell this tale yourself, all right. Conflicting emotions flickered across Sif's face, but Thor tugged at her once more. Enough, let's retreat. With renewed desire for life, Sif and Thor dashed backward, evading the laser discharged by the destroyer armor, they swiftly circled around and regrouped with the others in a nearby alley. At that moment, 
it seemed Thor had finally reached a decision. After ensuring everyone's safety, he turned and advanced towards the destroyer armor. Brother, I know you can hear me, Thor earnestly spoke as he approached the armor. Whatever transgressions I have committed in the past, for which you cannot forgive me, I offer my sincerest apologies. But they are innocent. Thor now knew the truth, revealed by his friends, their father was not dead, and Loki had orchestrated it all. Yet, Thor couldn't shake the feeling of responsibility and unintentional harm caused by his past actions. The destroyer armor paid no heed to Thor's words, immediately charging energy upon seeing him approach. Allow me to atone for everything, brother, Thor faced the formidable armor, his smile filled with relief. Take my life and spare the others, all right. After Thor finished speaking, the destroyer armor hesitated. In Asgard, Loki watched the unfolding scene, flashes of past images crossing his mind. A vision of Thor being incinerated by the laser materialized, causing an unexpected uneasiness to ripple through Loki. He furrowed his brow, feeling a sense of discomfort for reasons unknown. As a result, the destroyer armor suddenly halted its assault, and the faceplate on its helmet began closing. Witnessing this, Thor also breathed a sigh of relief, assuming his younger brother still held concern for him. However, in the next moment, Thor's assumption was proven wrong as the destroyer abruptly struck him with tremendous force a blow that can kill ordinary people, a full-powered strike of an Asgard artifact. As a mortal, the impact caused immense physical harm, sending Thor hurtling backward, crashing heavily onto the ground, and losing consciousness. The destroyer did not pursue its attack further but simply turned around and departed. To the astonishment of both the armor and its controller in Asgard, the armor unexpectedly encountered a figure ahead Fang Mo. Chapter 37, Fang Mo vs the Destroyer 2 Thor bravely approached the imposing destroyer, but was forcefully thrown aside. Jane quickly broke free from Dr. Selvig's grasp and rushed to help Thor. The Asgardian warriors also noticed and hurried towards Thor, eager to rescue him. Among the onlookers, Darcy Lewis noticed the peculiar behavior of the destroyer. Initially worried it might turn and resume its laser assault, she realized it seemed fixated on something. Darcy followed its gaze and saw a man wielding a colossal blade. Who is that Darcy asked, curious. Is he one of your companions? Our companions Valstag, with fewer injuries, raised his head and spotted Fang Mo not far away. Utterly astonished, he stammered, he's not one of us. What Darcy was taken aback. It's dangerous. Hogan urgently shouted from the other side, noticing the man's weapon. Hogan assumed he must be a warrior, but they were still on Earth. Could a mortal warrior be stronger than an Asgardian like himself? Even Hogan stood no chance against the destroyer, so this mortal's intervention seemed futile. Step back. You're no match for this guy. Before Hogan could finish, the faceplate of the destroyer suddenly opened, and a deadly laser surged towards the man. Witnessing this, Everyone couldn't fathom what would happen next. Sif and Darcy couldn't bear to watch and instinctively shut their eyes. That armor was personally crafted by King Odin himself. Surviving such a fearsome laser would be a miracle, let alone emerging unscathed. Yet, just as everyone braced for the worst, an astounding scene unfolded before their eyes. As the laser approached, an invisible ripple materialized in mid-air, intercepting the deadly beam. Then, the man swiftly extended his hand towards the destroyer, exerting a powerful force of attraction. The uncontrollable armor hurtled towards him, and in that moment, he raised his purple giant blade and struck the armor with ruthless force. A resounding boom echoed as the destroyer spun violently and crashed into a nearby building. What? Everyone's eyes widened in disbelief. The Asgardian warriors, in particular, were utterly astonished. Their confidence and understanding shattered completely. Had a mortal truly sent the destroyer flying with a single blow surely, this must be a joke. They had battled so long without leaving a scratch on their formidable foe. Yet now, a being from Midgard had effortlessly sent the destroyer flying with one strike even Val's tag began to question his own sanity, attributing his injuries to hallucinations. Meanwhile, Fang Mo, the man perceived as a Midgardian. In that moment, he closely examined the hellish cleaver in his hand. Although the cleaver had materialized, it originated from the Tinker Construct module. To test its attributes, 
Pang Ammo deliberately set its durability at level 5, making it unbreakable. However, Fang Ammo remained uncertain if this property could be inherited in the real world, and this is how the scene unfolded at the beginning. Fang Ammo tested the weapon against the destroyer. The result confirmed that even after colliding with Asgard's toughest URU metal, the hellish cleaver showed no signs of damage or dulling. It seems that attributes can be materialized as well, Fang Ammo thoughtfully nodded after inspecting the cleaver. Suddenly, a nearby building exploded, engulfed in smoke, and the destroyer emerged unscathed. After all, it was Odin's battle armor, and its durability proved extraordinary. But that was exactly what Fang Ammo desired. I've finally found someone worthy of a fight, Fang Mo's excitement was palpable. Since returning to the Marvel world, he had developed numerous new things. However, he grew bored without opponents to test his skills. Once a god of war in the virtual realm, now awakened with his stand, his fighting spirit was fully unleashed. He found greater satisfaction in personally defeating the movie's bosses than in the tedium of crafting and browsing crafting tables. As for the destroyer, it represented the silent villains. At that moment, it made no additional moves. Walking out of the sea of fire, it directed a laser beam at Fang Ammo. A purple light flickered at Fang Mo's fingertips, and the ground beneath the destroyer quaked. In the next second, rocks, dust, and soil rushed towards it from all directions, enclosing it within a massive sphere of rock. However, the surface of the rock sphere turned red, and scorching heat erupted from within. The rock transformed into searing lava, cascading onto the ground. The destroyer struggled to break free. Yet, before it could emerge fully, Fang Ammo hurled the hellish cleaver directly at it. With a loud bang, the headpiece of the destroyer split in half, but the armor swiftly began repairing itself. Just like when Sif impaled it to the ground, the restored destroyer continued to rise. It broke free from the lava sphere, retrieved the hellish cleaver lodged in its head, and cast it aside. Observing this, Fang Ammo nodded instinctively. Perhaps this was a characteristic of the destroyer to possess some degree of immunity against physical attacks. However, that worked in Fang Mo's favor. With a simple command, Fang Mo's stand, Steve, swung a sword at the destroyer. The armor stiffened slightly, revealing a cut on its chest. Sensing the attack, the destroyer lowered its head, fixing its gaze upon Steve, preparing to unleash a laser. Witnessing this, Fang Ammo swiftly gestured with his fingertip, activating the Ender Hand Force field. The ground beneath the destroyer surged upward, causing the laser to miss Steve's head and strike a nearby street instead. The awakened destroyer glared at Fang Ammo, recharging its laser. However, in the next moment, the massive hellish cleaver lying on the ground shimmered with a purple aura, levitating in the air. Its blade aimed at the back of the destroyer, swiftly piercing through its chest. Before the armor could react, a gust of wind blew in its face. Fang Ammo, now wielding a hammer, descended from the sky, delivering a mighty blow to the top of its head. With a deafening roar, the entire small town seemed to tremble as the ground beneath the destroyer shattered, creating a colossal crater. Chapter 38, Fang Ammo vs the Destroyer 3 The onlookers nearby were utterly shocked, whether they were Asgard warriors or ordinary humans like Jane Foster. They had just witnessed the raw power of the destroyer firsthand, and it was truly terrifying. This formidable machine unleashed astonishing laser power and appeared virtually indestructible. They were at a loss for how to confront such a threat. Yet, astonishingly, this monstrous engine of destruction was now being mercilessly pummeled by a lone individual, leaving it unable to retaliate. The sight of the destroyer being ruthlessly slammed into the ground left the crowd awestruck, particularly the Asgard warriors. Fang Mo's swings of the hammer transformed him into a heroic figure, blending with their perception of Thor, the god of thunder. Is it? Over Darcy asked, her voice laced with disbelief. Has that iron monster been defeated? Probably. Right Jane replied, her tone tinged with confusion. I can't fathom anyone enduring such an assault. However, as soon as she finished speaking, the destroyer rose from the ground, its armor pieces fluidly shifting and reforming. In the blink of an eye, all the previously damaged parts on its body were restored. All eyes turned to Jane, seeking an explanation. This. Jane herself was momentarily stunned before whispering in defense, 
Well, we must acknowledge that it's merely armor, devoid of a living being. Meanwhile, on the other side, Fang Mo, gripping the hammer, also experienced a measure of surprise. It wasn't the destroyer's ability to endure relentless battering that astonished him, but rather an unexpected electronic prompt that materialized in his mind. Ha Fang Mo was taken aback by the unforeseen sound. It perplexed him since he had unlocked the mutant creature's module when he defeated Abomination, but that was because Abomination was deemed a mutant organism. Now, he was contending with the destroyer, so what kind of module could be unlocked by this entity Fang Mo had no inkling, yet he viewed it as a golden opportunity to access a new module. If he failed to comprehend its usage, he could simply leave it be and still receive a lucky block. It appeared to be a win-win situation. With anticipation coursing through him, Fang Mo recognized the destroyer as an excellent punching bag. It could withstand his blows and provided a gratifying sensation. However, his present disposition no longer inclined him to continue assaulting a mere target. Achieving high scores through his strikes couldn't rival the exhilaration he experienced when drawing a card. Well, it seems the time has come to unveil my true skills. Yielding to the enticement of the lucky block, Fang Mo suppressed his playful demeanor and inhaled deeply, his countenance turning solemn. With a commanding wave of his hand, the once ferocious destroyer was sent hurtling through the air, as mentioned earlier during Fang Mo's confrontation with Obadiah, his ender hand force field lacked control over living beings. However, since the destroyer was merely an inanimate suit of armor, Fang Mo had already emerged triumphant. In mid-air, the destroyer aimed its laser beams at Fang Mo, but with a swift wave of his hand, the hammer spun and hurtled toward the armor, producing a resounding impact that knocked its head askew. In a split second, Fang Mo transformed into particles of light, teleporting directly behind the destroyer. Swinging the hellish cleaver, he brought it crashing down on the armor's head, forcefully driving it into the ground like a cannonball. However, the battle was not yet over. Fang Mo summoned the hammer back into his hand, while the lower half of the destroyer remained firmly embedded in the earth, struggling to free itself with its hands planted firmly. Here, Fang Mo's stand exhibited its superiority. Unlike Steve's game attacks, it was not constrained by attack speed. The strength of Fang Mo's spiritual will influence the speed of his stand's assaults. The wide and sturdy hellish cleaver, reminiscent of a door, unleashed a flurry of illusions with its astonishing attack speed, leaving no opportunity for the destroyer to retaliate. As the destroyer endured the relentless assault and endeavored to extricate its legs from the ground, Fang Mo took action. He swiftly launched the hellish cleaver from his grip. Controlled by the ender hand force field and infused with tremendous force, the blade slashed across the top of the destroyer's head. The metallic friction reverberated as the blade tore through the armor's head plate, deeply embedding itself in its chest. Heavily damaged, the destroyer stiffened, activating the magic runes inscribed within it, preparing to initiate self-repair of its pieces. However, seizing the moment, Fang Mo descended like a shooting star. Before the destroyer could react, the hammer, enveloped in an overloaded ender hand force field, dealt a devastating blow to the hellish cleaver. The scene appeared momentarily frozen. Then, an eruption of kinetic energy ensued. The hammer, lacking the unbreakable attribute, exploded upon impact. Simultaneously, the tremendous force propelled the hellish cleaver through the chest plate of the destroyer, creating sparks as it descended. Ultimately, the armor was cleaved in two, while the hellish cleaver, carrying its undiminished momentum, crashed heavily onto the ground and vanished within it. Having accomplished these feats, Fang Mo raised his hands and made a tearing motion, preventing the armor from regenerating. The ender hand force field emitted a faint glow, lifting the armor's body from the ground. It swiftly flew in two divergent directions, causing soil and rocks to cascade from the ground and encase the armor's form. Growing larger, akin to a snowball rolling downhill, it eventually came to rest outside the town. With the tasks completed, the destroyer lay motionless. At that opportune moment, a prompt resounded in Fang Mo's mind. System prompt, you have acquired the relevant structure of the destroyer. You have obtained 80% download permission for new modules. However, upon hearing this prompt, Fang Mo was dumbfounded. What in the world is this? Fang Mo was instantly afflicted by a headache. Hey. What's the deal with this module's progress bar I've already defeated this boss, 
and now you decide to notify me I'm left with only 20%. Where on earth am I supposed to find the remaining components for you? Chapter 39 Fang Emma was utterly bewildered, struggling to comprehend the current module he faced. His system remained frustratingly unresponsive, activating only under specific trigger conditions, regardless of how vehemently one cursed at it. Damn, unbelievable. With a sense of numbness, Fang Ammo fixated on the meager 20% progress bar lingering in his mind. Regarding his ability to unlock new modules using his stand, Fang Ammo grappled with uncertainty. Was his current predicament a mere impasse in progress, or did it require unlocking one module before accessing others could he possibly unlock multiple modules simultaneously for instance, if he inadvertently triggered an inaccessible technology-related module, could a visit to the Sorcerer Tower of Kamartage and random interactions with objects unlock a magic-related module engrossed in these ruminations, a sudden sound jolted Fang Ammo from his thoughts. Hmm. He gazed upward and beheld a small dot hurtling through the sky, veering towards Asgard. In a flash, a lightning bolt crashed down, engulfing the town in a blaze of blinding white light. Rising from the ground, the thunder transformed into resplendent armor and a majestic cape. It was unmistakably Thor, having reclaimed his divine power. Radiant with lightning, Thor wasted no time on pleasantries. He brandished his hammer and sword towards the town's outskirts, emanating an aura of formidable divine. However, upon reaching his destination, Thor was dumbfounded by two colossal boulders sprawled on the ground. What? Thor stared at the bewildering sight, his countenance marked by sheer confusion. Where is the destroyer? In that moment, a voice reverberated through the air. You're too slow. I've already dealt with that abominable thing. Startled by the voice, Thor instinctively looked downward, catching sight of Fang Ammo engrossed in a search within a sizable pit. Thor hesitated before inquiring, Is that you, sorcerer? Just call me Fang Ammo. As he spoke, Fang Ammo continued his examination of the pit. Fang Ammo. Thor descended gradually, captivated by the enigmatic figure. Did you truly vanquish the destroyer, my father's armor and what task occupies you now? I'm retrieving my weapon. Fang Ammo extended his hand and pointed towards the ground. During their clash with the destroyer, Fang Ammo had exerted immense force, embedding his hellish cleaver deep within the earth. Fortunately, he activated the Ender Hand Force field, causing the ground to tremble. In the next instant, the colossal hellish cleaver, as wide as a door panel, emerged from its subterranean abode, finding a firm grasp in Fang Mo's hands. Uh. Thor stood dumbfounded, beholding the spectacle. Is this your weapon? It is forged from a unique alloy of adidate ore and cobalt blue, found exclusively in the depths of hell. I call it the hellish cleaver. Fang Mo nonchalantly rested the weighty blade upon his shoulder, moreover, I have bestowed upon it an indestructible magical blessing, rendering it on par with Asgard's weaponry. But... Thor appeared puzzled. Aren't you a sorcerer? Do you possess knowledge of magic are you a sorcerer Fang Ammo countered directly? Although magic casting usually requires specific mediums like rings or small accessories at Kamartaj Tower, or wands at Hogwarts. Who's to say that a magical medium cannot take the form of a sword? Well... Thor was left dumbfounded. For some reason, he found himself strangely inclined to agree with the other's words. Yes, his younger brother Loki was indeed a mage. Due to his physical frailty, he couldn't become a mighty warrior like Thor. Their mother, Frigga, took pity on Loki and passed down her magic to him. However, Loki didn't exhibit the typical behavior of a mage. Among the vast repertoire of powerful spells, he focused solely on illusion magic, using it to deceive enemies directly in combat while launching hidden attacks with a small dagger from behind. That small dagger was a gift from Frigga to Loki, and it possessed genuine magical properties. Upon reflection, it seemed plausible that magical mediums could take the shape of a sword. Perhaps Loki's powers were too feeble to wield a massive sword, so he opted for a smaller blade instead. But weren't mages supposed to possess weak physical strength and formidable spells what was the true nature of the person standing before him could anyone truly wield such an enormous blade well, perhaps I have been ignorant, Thor eventually relinquished his ponderings. Regardless, I appreciate your assistance, Fang Ammo. However, 
I must return now and have a serious conversation with my brother. If an opportunity arises in the future, I will extend an invitation for you to visit Asgard as an honored guest. Upon uttering these words, Thor began to spin his hammer, preparing to take flight. Wait. Fang Emo suddenly interjected. Hm Thor halted, ceasing his movements. What is it? No need to wait for the future, Fang Emo smiled and remarked, who knows when the Bifrost Bridge might be destroyed so, I have decided to accompany you back to Asgard now. This. Thor hesitated, while we gods are indeed hospitable, I am returning this time to confront a crisis. My brother intends to kill our father and seize the throne of Asgard. Don't worry, your brother isn't as malicious as you believe, Fang Emma waved his hand dismissively. He still cares about all of you. He simply desires to eradicate Jotunheim and eliminate all the frost giants. Hathor was utterly perplexed. No, why would he do such a thing? Because he himself is a frost giant. When Odin was conquering Jotunheim, he discovered an abandoned baby in the ice palace. That child was Lafay, the king of the frost giant's offspring, left to perish in a corner due to his feeble condition. Fang Emo shrugged. Now Loki knows the truth, and his mental state is unstable, but to be fair, his actions are somewhat understandable. It's akin to living as a demon in the human world, only to find out through exposure to demon magic that you belong to the same race as the enemy of humans in your case, the Asgardians who committed unspeakable atrocities. If that doesn't shatter your mentality. Are you saying Loki is a frost giant? Thor widened his eyes in disbelief and exclaimed, How is that possible his skin is not blue? I've been saying. Ugh, I mean, Odin bestowed him with magical blessings, Fang Emo sighed, rubbing his forehead. When he comes into contact with the power of ice, his true heritage awakens. Initially, he had no knowledge of his true identity. It was you who insisted on bringing them to invade Jotunheim, leading Loki to encounter the frost giant's magic and learn the truth. This. Hearing this revelation, Thor staggered back two steps, shocked. Could it be that I am the cause of all this? Chapter 40 Thor was completely shocked when he heard this, as if struck by lightning. After Fang Mo's reminder, many previously incomprehensible things now made sense. For instance, the reason why his father, the king, was so furious and stripped him of his divine power after he trespassed into Jotunheim. It might not have been solely due to the grudges and wars between the Frost Giants and Asgard, but also because Loki could have discovered his true identity. The psychological impact Loki would suffer after learning all of this was unimaginable to Thor. No wonder Loki manipulated the Destroyer to cause trouble for him. No, I have to go back and talk to him. Thor became anxious at the thought and didn't wait for the Asgardian warriors. He shouted, looking up, Heimdall. Take me back. However, after waiting for a while, there was no movement in the sky. Heimdall. Sif also looked puzzled, furrowing her brows. Why is there no movement? Let's wait a little longer, reassured Fang Emo, who knew the reason for the current situation. Loki had probably already begun executing his plan to deceive Lafay, the king of the frost giants, into invading Asgard. Loki would catch him off guard, kill him, and subsequently destroy Jotunheim. To successfully implement his plan, Loki would first need to deal with Heimdall, the Guardian. Heimdall was likely frozen in the icy power of the ancient Winter Coffin. However, Heimdall's strength was formidable, and it wouldn't be long before he broke free. While they waited, a vehicle approached from a distance with the Asgardian warriors and Jane Foster. Thor explained the urgent situation to them, being cautious about revealing Loki's true identity as a frost giant. He only mentioned that Loki planned to destroy Jotunheim, and he needed to go back to stop him. Meanwhile, Heimdall heard Thor's call. He broke free from the ice and defeated the frost giant who had been guarding him. With his injured body, Heimdall walked into the teleportation chamber and activated the Bifrost Bridge by inserting his sword into the mechanism. As the Bifrost Bridge activated, Thor noticed the change in the clouds above and quickly bid farewell to Jane Foster. A colorful light descended from the sky, and Fang Emo joined them as they all disappeared from the spot. In the teleportation chamber, Thor immediately noticed Heimdall sitting on the ground, visibly injured. He instructed his friends to take him for treatment and prepared to fly to the throne. However, 
Heimdall spoke up, questioning why Fang Mo had come along too. Thor looked surprised, but with the urgency of the situation, he didn't have time to dwell on it. He simply said, Fang Mo is my friend. I'm going with him to find Loki. Without hesitation, Thor flew towards the throne, determined to confront his brother. Fang Mo remained silent and followed directly. Meanwhile, inside the palace of Asgard, the guards were already engaged in battle with the Frost Giants. King Lofe, the Frost Giant, had arrived in Odin's chambers, preparing to kill his opponent with pride. Suddenly, a laser beam shot towards him, causing severe injuries and sending him crashing to the ground. Finally, at this moment, Lofe understood Loki's plot. Loki had never intended to cooperate with him. His earlier words were merely a deceit to lure Lofe away from Jotunheim. The Frost Giants, powerful as they were, were easily influenced by the external environment. In Jotunheim, with the ancient winter casket in their possession, they could unleash 500% of their strength. But in the royal palace of Asgard, where it remained spring-like throughout the year, Lofe could only exert 10% of his power. Helplessly, he watched as his own son, Loki, raised Gungnir and mercilessly blasted him into pieces. Loki. Frigga, the queen, who stood nearby, unaware of Loki's scheme, struggled to rise from the ground and joyfully embraced her son. You saved your father. Mother, they will pay the price for this, Loki immediately responded. Before Frigga could say anything more, footsteps approached the door. Loki instinctively looked up and saw Thor and Fang Emo standing there, freezing in place. Thor. Frigga turned her head and was instantly overjoyed. She rushed over and embraced Thor tightly. I knew you would come back. I have missed you greatly, mother, Thor smiled at Frigga but then turned to Loki, his tone turning serious. But now, I want to have a serious conversation with my brother. Upon hearing this, Loki became visibly panicked. However, his mind was currently occupied with his unraveling plan, and he failed to notice Thor's concern and sincerity written on his face. Indeed, in the original story, Thor was unaware of Loki's reasons for turning evil. He only knew that Loki had sent the destroyer to kill him, so he returned to Asgard consumed by anger. Upon his arrival, he confronted Loki directly, and the conflict escalated, leading to the destruction of the Bifrost. But now, things were different. Thor's perspective had shifted after learning the truth. The problem was, Loki was unaware of any of this. He was truly panicking now. Freezing Heimdall and the others was his attempt to prevent their return, but now, not only had Thor regained his godly powers, but Fang Emo stood beside him as well. Loki had witnessed Fang Emo easily defeat the destroyer, which was made with URU metal. It shattered like a watermelon in Fang Mo's hands. Loki doubted his own ability to match URU's toughness. Loki, I. Thor took a step forward, seemingly about to address Loki. However, to everyone's surprise, Loki made the first move. He suddenly aimed Gungnir at Thor. Caught off guard, Thor was sent flying by the attack, crashing through the outer wall of the palace and plummeting down. Loki. Thor. Queen Frigga was also stunned and quickly shouted. Mother, I'm sorry, but the frost giants must pay, Loki raised his head and said to Frigga. He then waved his hand, and the ancient winter casket appeared, instantly releasing a chilling cold air towards Fang Mo. Loki seemed to realize he couldn't match Fang Mo's power and intended to freeze him to buy some time. However, to Loki's surprise, Fang Mo's figure instantly transformed into purple light and vanished. The cold air struck the chamber wall, leaving it covered in a thick layer of ice. What? Loki was stunned by the sight. But in the next moment, he felt a cold blade pressing against his neck. Startled, Loki raised his hands, and with a loud clank, both the ancient winter casket and Gungnir fell to the ground. Witnessing this scene, Fang Ammo couldn't help but feel the urge to comment. But before he could say anything, an electronic prompt sounded in his mind. System prompt, new module features detected. Researching them will grant you download permissions. 